So hello, good morning, everybody. So thank you very much, Hugues, and uh, other people from the Collège de France for inviting me. I mean, it's always a great pleasure to, to come here, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the, all the discussion we will have today. I mean, as Edith said, I mean, uh, ecosystems are a really, I mean, important notion in biology, and it's really important to get uh, a kind of broad overview of the living world. And personally, I mean, I was trained in molecular biology and in genetics, and today I will try to talk about ecosystems. So, I mean, I apologize. I mean, I'm not also a specialist about ecosystems. But what I really like with the biology is that we are looking at various scales and how one scale, like the molecular scale, can act on populations and can act on uh, the external environment, on, on different uh, non-living molecules, for example. And this is really what I like with biology, that we are looking at various scales and how they interact together. And with my uh, question today, which is about uh, gene drives and the risk that gene drive can contaminate other species, you will see that this is really like one question, but to try to tackle this question, you need to, to study many different fields of biology and even Im immunology, which I'm not a specialist also. So you will see, I mean, I hope you will uh, enjoy my presentation. So before starting with a CRISPR-based gene drive, I would like just to give you a broad uh, description of what is a CRISPR. So I guess all of you, most, um, most of you know what it is. But So CRISPR is a method which uh, targets DNA. You can have a target in the DNA, which is a special sequence, and it will cut the DNA. So it seems like a, a simple technique, but it's really a, a revolution in biology because it can be used for many, many different things, and it's very easy to use. So it means that you can cut DNA, you can copy and paste DNA as you like, and it's not difficult compared to previous techniques. So CRISPR means cluster regulatory interspaced short palindromic repeats. So there are specific sequences which were first identified in a bacteria, and people didn't really know what they were, but many studies tried to understand the function of this specific sequence. And it was found that there are a specific mechanism used by bacteria which uh, help them to de detect and destroy virus DNA. So there are, there is a, it's a specific mechanism uh, which has evolved in bacteria, but nowadays people use it to, to manipulate uh, any type of uh, living organism. So how does it work? So you need a protein, which is called a Cas9. So this is uh, represented here. And so this protein will uh, have inside uh, the molecule a guide RNA. And the last, uh, sorry, the five prime sequence of the guide RNA uh, can be any sequence. And so you, people can design the sequence they want for this guide RNA. And this sequence will recognize uh, a target sequence which will have the corresponding sequence in the DNA. And the Cas9, uh, sorry, the Cas9 and the guide RNA together, when they recognize such a site in the DNA, they will uh, cut the DNA at this specific site. So this uh, guide RNA, I mean, it's important to remember for my presentation. So you specify it by, uh, I mean, uh, adding a specific sequence, and then there is a pan, a special uh, protospacer adjacent motif, which will be also uh, part of the DNA that is recognized with the first nucleotide, which can be any uh, thing, so A, T, C, or G, and then you should have G and G. So with uh, this complex, so a protein and a guide RNA, you can cut a specific DNA sequence. So before, we had other tools to cut DNA, for example, restriction enzymes, zinc finger nuclease, or transcription activator-like effector nuclease, talents. So there were different methods. And what is really uh, efficient with uh, this new method is that you need to just synthesize a specific guide RNA with a sequence, and it's much uh, faster. And also, it has been shown that it works in all the species which have been tested so far. So once you cut the DNA, you can uh, have repair uh, by the uh, cell. And so you will have specific mutation at the uh, position you, you target it in the genome. So you can have, uh, I mean, uh, when uh, it repairs, it will create a new mutation. What can, you can do also, if you cut the DNA, you can, I mean, while you cut the DNA, you also add a piece of DNA which has flanking regions which are homologous to the blue parts flanking the, the cut site. And so then, during the repair mechanism by homologous recombination, you will get a homology, sorry, a directed repair. You can get a new sequence which will uh, be made based on your repair template. So you can 
change a sequence into uh, your sequence of interest. So these are the two main uh, approach in which uh, gene dry, uh, sorry, in which uh, CRISPR is used. And so with the first approach, where you just cut and you simply let the cell uh, repair by itself, you can get various types of mutations. So here is a target site with the PAM site here in red. And so you can see that you can get deletions and also insertions. So you can uh, create mutants at a specific site of interest. So this technique is uh, used uh, by many labs uh, nowadays, and uh, it's a really good tool in which we now can do genetics in species in which it was not uh, possible before. So here I'm showing you one example with uh, butterflies uh, in Agrolis vanillae. So you inject uh, the protein and also your guide RNA into uh, the developing uh, uh, butterflies. And for example, if you target a gene called optics, which is involved in the formation of the orange pigments, you can get a f almost a fully black uh, wing, except uh, these uh, white patches here. So it's really uh, very uh, efficient. And uh, here, with another gene, a wind A, which is involved in the determining the border of the different uh, domains on the wings, you get a I mean, uh, you alter the, the pattern of the wing. So gene, uh, sorry, CRISPR is also used, uh, I mean, uh, on applied biology, and uh, because you can really target uh, specific uh, genes. So here is a recent slide where you see all the different uh, numbers of genes which have been uh, targeted and modified We're using CRISPR. And uh, so it, it allows uh, people uh, who develop uh, new uh, varieties to be much more efficient because you can really uh, get exactly the mutation of interest in a, a specific variety uh, that you already have. There are also applications in uh, the bi biomedical science so there are ongoing uh, clinical trials using CRISPR to try to, it's a kind of a gene therapy. And there are two main approaches. So one approach is in vivo and one approach ex vivo. So in vivo, uh, people are trying to uh, repair genes uh, which are present within the patient. And so nowadays uh, there are trials with uh, retina disease because uh, then you can uh, specifically modify the genes only in the retina cells, which is a... a I mean, a small part of the body. And then uh, CRISPR has uh, potentially a lot of applications on cells which you can remove from the body and then put back into the patient. So this is the ex vivo approach where cells are taken from the patient, genes are modified in the lab using CRISPR, and then cells are transferred back to the patient. So this can work for specific types of disease, like uh, disease which affect uh, the blood, for example. So. One thing uh, to know about, gene, about uh, sorry, CRISPR, uh, which is uh, important to keep in mind, is that all uh, these uh, applications of CRISPR would not have been possible if people uh, didn't do fundamental research. CRISPR was really identified because people were interested in mechanisms of uh, bacteria, how bacteria are resistant to virus. I mean, it looks like it's not an important question. I mean, how? I mean, who cares about bacteria? I mean. Of course, here we can. <laughs> but, so it's a good example uh, to, I mean, uh, to show to people that it's really important to do uh, fundamental research because sometimes we find uh, things which could have a very important uh, applications. So before, I mean, we had uh, like the stack polymerase to amplify DNA, which was uh, made possible because people uh, studied bacteria which live in very hot environments. Studying other types of bacteria uh, made the possibility of dis uh, discovering restriction enzymes. And then uh, by uh, studying uh, jellyfish, uh, it was made possible to make the tissue fluorescent with uh, proteins, which was a very uh, big advance also for uh, life imaging. And uh, nowadays, I mean, uh, we have CRISPR, which is really a revolution. And this is, uh, I mean, because people uh, study the uh, virus resistance in bacteria. So now I will go to uh, gene drive. So gene drive is, uh, in French, is called uh, forçage genétique. So it's a new technique uh, which, uh, I mean, was uh, discussed. I mean, uh, and but uh, gene drive made it made it possible to to apply it in a in a better, more efficient way. So usually, when you have a normal reproduction, each uh, individual, when you have sexual reproduction, will produce uh, gametes. And uh, if you think about uh, uh, diploid individuals, so the for each uh, pair of chromosomes, only one of them will uh, go into the gamete, okay? So you have, uh, one gamete will have 50% of chance to have the black chromosome and 50% of chance to have the green chromosome. So this means that if you look over many generations, 
if you look at one type of chromosome, you have one chance out of two to, be, to have this chromosome transmitted to, to the next uh, progeny. What is different with uh, gene drive is that it uh, changes the way uh, chromosomes are transferred to the next generation, so that one diploid individual will be more likely to transfer the chromosome which carries a gene drive, so here's a blue chromosome, and so most of the gametes will have uh, this blue chromosome. And so if you look at uh, several generations, you can see that the, here the red chromosome which contains the gene drive will be present in all uh, the population. So theoretical model shows that if you put only a few individuals which have a chromosome carrying a gene drive, after less than a thousand uh, generation, all uh, the individuals uh, should, have, uh, should be contaminated with uh, this uh, gene drive. So gene drive uses uh, CRISPR, and uh, here you can uh, probably recognize the different partners of, uh, for CRISPR. And uh, what is special with uh, gene drive is that it makes all these partners be all together and act on themselves as a loop. So I will explain better. So here you have the DNA, okay? Here you have the guide RNA, and here the Cas9 protein. And so uh, gene drive makes all uh, these uh, partners be combined all together at one site within a genome. So you have on uh, one part of the genome uh, what is called a gene drive cassette. So this cassette will contain the Cas9 gene, okay, the gene which, pro which will be producing the Cas9 protein. It also contains a gene which encodes the guide RNA. You can also add a cargo gene if you want to add up a gene that you want to spread in a population, but you don't have to. I mean, uh, and then you also add the flanking region here, which flank the cut site, which is present in uh, your normal uh, target population. So here it means that you have all uh, together at one site. And so if you have a chromosome which contains this uh, gene drive cassette, the Cas9 protein will be produced, the guide RNA will be produced, together they will recognize the cut size, they will cut, and the cut will be repaired, and it will be repaired using the flanking regions of the Cas9 cassette, so that at the end you will have the, cas the gene drive cassette which will be present on the other copy, on the other chromosome. So it's a mechanism for the gene drive cassette to copy itself on another chromosome. So with this, so you can have a conversion, so the copy mechanism can occur in the gonad, so that the individual will still be a heterozygote for the gene drive uh, uh, chromosome, okay? But all the gametes will uh, be uh, with the gene drive uh, cassette. Another possibility is that the conversion occurs in the zygote, and in which case all the cells of the individual will have the two copies of the gene drive on each uh, chromosome. So there are many different applications of uh, gene drive. So here I'm showing you a few of them. So the main uh, one which is uh, described in the media is the one for eradicating uh, disease vectors, and especially uh, malaria vectors, so eliminating uh, mosquitoes. But it uh, can have other applications. For example, it can be used to eradicate invasive uh, pest species. In the New Zealand, people are trying to see whether they can use it to uh, eradicate invasive uh, black rats which are threatening a different uh, endemic species in uh, New Zealand. You can also use it to spread mildly deleterious mutations in uh, different target populations. So for example here, one uh, possibility which has been suggested is to reduce the height of invasive uh, weeds so that they are not as competitive as the native ones and as the native plants. And you can also imagine that you can use it for conservation biology to uh, save endangered species and by uh, spreading bio beneficial mutations. So here one example is that uh, these leopard frogs, they are um, I mean, affected by pathogenic fun fungi. And uh, we know um, in, uh, one type of gene that could make them resistant to these fungi, so we could, for example, uh, try to spread them in these populations. So uh, this technique so far is, uh, has been done only in the laboratory, so there are, has not been any uh, release in the wild, okay? So it's being developed uh, in the laboratory. So CRISPR uh, papers were first published in uh, 2012, and the first uh, gene drive uh, organisms using CRISPR were published in uh, 2015. So you can see it's a very recent uh, technique, only uh, a few years. So it's being developed in the lab, and so far, uh, I mean, um, we don't know when it will be applied uh, in, uh, in the wild. 
So the first paper was a paper where they showed that gene drive can work in a Drosophila melanogaster flies. So here what they use is a gene drive cassette, which contains a guide RNA, which will uh, target the yellow gene. So it makes the flies yellow compared to their normal uh, color. And it can uh, be uh, inherited with more than 95% in more than 95% of the progeny. And a second paper which was published uh, in the same year was on uh, mosquitoes and Anopheles stephensi. And in the, this paper, they included uh, cargo genes in the uh, gene drive cassette. And these cargo genes uh, make, uh, can make antibodies which are against the malaria par parasite. So it makes the mosquito resistant to uh, a non-vector of, uh, of uh, malaria. Another paper which was published on the same year on uh, another species of mosquito, here uses another technique. Instead of using a cargo gene, here the gene drive cassette will insert at a specific site, which is a gene required for female fertility. And when the gene drive cassette inserts into the gene, it makes the female sterile, and so uh, they cannot uh, reproduce. And so if you have, but still this uh, gene drive can uh, spread through the male. And if you make models, you can see that uh, after a while, the population will decrease and uh, will be eliminated. And indeed, this is what uh, can happen when they make uh, cages with a lot of uh, mosquitoes. And they put just a few individuals carrying the, the gene drive. So nowadays, I would say that there are two major applications of gene drive which are most advanced, which are more likely to be uh, used in the future. The first one is uh, on Drosophila suzukii, which is very close to Drosophila melanogaster. It's an invasive uh, pest species which originates from Asia, and uh, it uh, invaded uh, Europe and uh, the, uh, America since uh, 2008. And it's, uh, it causes a lot of problems because uh, on its ovipositor, it has a fine teeth which can break a fresh fruit, and then they insert uh, their eggs into the fruit, and so they make the fruit uh, rotten much faster than uh, usual, and so they cause a lot of uh, problems and a lot of loss for agriculture. Another application is uh, with uh, the vectors of malaria, so Anopheles mosquitoes. So it's also, uh, I mean, uh, a system which is uh, progressing. Uh, quite rapidly, especially because there are a lot of money involved in uh, this type of research with the project uh, Target Malaria, which is uh, financed by uh, Bill Gates. So he puts a lot of money in, uh, in, uh, in this research. So what is novel of, about uh, gene drive? So I told you that uh, what is novel is that you have several pieces of DNA which are assembled together. Usually in bacteria, they were not put all uh, together at a specific uh, DNA site. So here you have the guide RNA the gene uh, encoding uh, Cas9, and also the flanking uh, regions, which are all uh, put together. And what is different also is that you have eukaryote cis regulatory regions, which uh, drive expression of the gene uh, Cas9 and the guide RNA, compared to bacteria, where they have uh, their own uh, bacterial cis regulatory regions. So it means that we are one step, uh, I mean, closer to uh, contamination to other species, because it makes like a small piece of DNA being uh, quite uh, potent. And this uh, small piece of DNA can manipulate two of the three pillars of evolution. It can, it can manipulate mutations, because instead of having mutation occurring randomly within the genome, here it will make mutation occur at the target site. And the mutation will be special. It will be the insertion of the gene drive cassette. And it also alters the transmission, because uh, as I uh, showed you, uh, one individual which is a heterozygote will only produce uh, chromosomes which will have the gene drive, so it biases uh, transmission. And uh, if you have a bias in a mutation and transmission, it means that even uh, genes which are not so good, like for example a, a gene which makes a female sterile, can still spread into population and make uh, the population go extinct. So I think it's potentially more effective than other biotechnologies because of its ease of use. I mean, you simply need to prepare a piece, a simple piece of DNA. It's, uh, it can uh, change uh, population quite rapidly within uh, a dozen generations. And what is uh, also uh, quite important to, to have in mind is that uh, it's a very new technique. So we are, the regulatory environment is not prepared for this technique. And before, we, we didn't have such a technique, which is a molecular technique, which can have effects on uh, ecosystems like that. 
So what are the risks? So there are different types of risks. So you can have molecular off-targets. So it means that instead of uh, having a mutation at the target site, you have mutation at other sites within a genome. You can have propagation to non-target population, non-target species. You can have also consequences for ecosystems. So if one uh, population is eliminated, maybe it will affect uh, other species which were dependent on, uh, on this uh, population. And then also uh, people are developing uh, countermeasures. If we th think that the gene drive was not a good idea, we want to uh, stop it. I mean, uh, so far the countermeasures are still uh, under development and we are not sure they, they would work. So today, uh, I would like to focus on uh, one risk, which I uh, was uh, interested in, uh, especially, I mean, because I'm also a molecular biologist and a geneticist, which is a risk of propagation to a non-target species. So this is uh, my uh, last part of my talk. So the risk of a gene drive contaminating a non-target species. And uh, so this was a risk I was uh, thinking of, but still, I mean, it involved a lot of parameters. So I was really happy that... Uh, uh, we could uh, work together with uh, Antoine Danchin, Pierre-Henri Gouillon, and uh, Christophe Butt on, uh, on this problem because we could uh, bring our expertise to try to see whether this uh, contamination is possible and how it would occur and uh, how likely it is. So together we come up with uh, several events which have to happen for the gene drive to, be, uh, contami uh, to contaminate another species. So the first one is that you, ha you need to have the DNA to transfer from one species, from the target species, to another species. So this transfer can occur through hybridization with a closely related species, and it could also occur through horizontal uh, transfer. So I will go through uh, I mean, all these different steps uh, after. Then, uh, what you, so once the DNA has been transferred to uh, another species, the gene drive uh, has to be expressed, okay? So the Cas9 gene and the guide RNA gene has to be expressed in the new host. The guide RNA and the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, complex have to be uh, active and to recognize the target and to cut in the new host. Then there should be flanking sequences around the cut site so that the gene drive cassette can copy itself uh, to this uh, specific cut site. Then uh, you uh, should have an immune probability here that the immune system does not reject uh, Cas9 expressing cells. And then uh, if uh, all this uh, machinery is present, and at the beginning you will have the gene drive cassette only in one individual or two individuals, so you need to have uh, a probability so that the drive is not eliminated uh, randomly just uh, the way I mean, uh, the sp uh, individuals will mate with each other, so that the drive will invade uh, the population. So regarding the first uh, parameter, so the risk of uh, hybridization, so here I will just show you an uh, uh, estimation of this risk for the two uh, main uh, models in which uh, gene drive is uh, being developed. So Drosophila suzukii is originating from Asia, and there are two species in Asia which are close to Drosophila suzukii, Drosophila subpulcrella and Drosophila pulcrella. So they are really close to each other. And uh, people who do, did uh, genome uh, sequencing, they could see that uh, we know that there have been a recent introgression between Drosophila subpulcrella and Drosophila suzukii. And also in the laboratory, it was uh, possible to create hybrids between uh, subpulcrella and uh, suzukii, and these hybrids are fertile. So it means that uh, these species can hybridize. And uh, this one is found in a temperate and a tropical uh, climate. And so, if we target uh, Suzuki in our temperate environment, I mean, if we find a way for them to be really confined to Europe or to America, maybe uh, it will be okay. But if some of them uh, migrate and go uh, to Asia, it's possible that they will uh, contaminate these other species. For Anopheles mosquitoes, so there is a complex of uh, eight different species, which are the Anopheles gambiae complex. And uh, this uh, complex of species is highly studied because uh, people want to know whether there are hybridization between them, for example, for development of resistance. And uh, the, these three uh, are the ones which are targeted by uh, the pro project Target Malaria, and there are three uh, mosquitoes which are vectors of malaria. And it is known that uh, genes from Arabiensis uh, transfer to Gambiae and, uh, re reciprocally. And for example, uh, genes involved in a resistance to insecticides. So we know that there are hybrid hybridization is possible between uh, some of them. So all these species are morphologically indistinguishable 
Okay, so uh, they are very close to each other. So this is one part of the risk. Uh, the other risk uh, is that it can transfer through horizontal uh, transfer. So we know a lot of uh, types of horizontal transfer. So here in, uh, on this uh, diagram, they put most of the horizontal transfer going from bacteria to eukaryotes. But we know also that there are uh, genes in bacteria which come from eukaryotes. And you can also have horizontal transfer within uh, eukaryotes. And uh, horizontal transfers are usually detected uh, when people uh, sequence genomes. And within genomes, they will find a piece of uh, DNA. And when they make a phylogeny, this piece of DNA will be uh, more similar to uh, species which are very far in the phylogeny. In the phylogeny. And that's how people uh, find uh, this type of events, uh, this type of horizontal transfer. So these, uh, the pieces of uh, DNA which are transferred through horizontal transfer can be, in general, about uh, several kb. But we know cases in which uh, pieces which are up to 150 kb, which got transferred from one plant species to another, or from one animal to another animal. So it can uh, still be quite big. And uh, a gene drive cassette is about is, uh, several kb, so it's, uh, this, it can be uh, transferred. So the genes which are transferred, which we can find in the phylogeny, are usually genes which have uh, an effect and which uh, make uh, the species uh, better adapted uh, in uh, some ways. So here is one example in uh, aphids. So you can have aphids which are green or orange, and this is due to uh, production of uh, carotenoids. And uh, carotenoids are, cannot be uh, produced de novo by animals in general. And here what is special with the uh, P aphids is that if you look at the enzymes involved in a uh, carotenoid biosynthesis and you make a phylogeny, you can see that the enzyme genes are close to fungi genes. And actually, it was a horizontal transfer from fungi to uh, P aphids, so that P aphids are now able to produce their own uh, carotenoids and to have their own uh, color. And you have mutation in one of the genes, so that there, there is a green morph or a red morph, depending on which carotenoid they produce. And what is interesting with this example is that we also see carotenoid production in a two-spotted uh, spider mite. And this is also due to a horizontal transfer of the gene from another fungi species to this uh, particular species. So it occurred many different times. So if you have a piece of DNA which uh, goes through horizontal transfer to another species, in general, it will be lost with time, unless there is an advantage of having uh, this gene, like for example for carotenoid, or unless the piece of DNA can uh, duplicate and uh, multiply in the new host genome. And so this is what occurs for transposable elements. Okay. So transposable elements are pieces of DNA that are able to integrate themselves in other places in, uh, on chromosomes. And usually when you have transposable elements, you have many of them per genome. They can cut and insert themselves at multiple sites. And they have endogenous mechanisms to integrate into DNA. Gene drive, as are, uh, on the other hand, usually you have only one per genome. And it cuts and inserts itself at a specific target site within a genome. So gene drive elements are similar to what are called homing endonuclease elements, which are elements which uh, we have found in nature, which, in which usually you have one per genome, which can cut and insert itself at a target site. So it's a mechanism very similar to, to gene drive. Unfortunately, we don't know uh, the rate of horizontal transfer of uh, homing endonuclease. I mean, uh, there are not so many studies of them. There is one case in which uh, they studied one uh, type of uh, homing endonuclease which targets the COX-1 gene. And uh, in this case, they found that in, when they studied 165 uh, plant species, they found 70 events of uh, horizontal transfer between species. So still, you can see it's able to, uh, to migrate to other species quite rapidly. And for transposable elements, we have uh, more data. And for example, in uh, one study where they looked at three closely related species of Drosophila, they looked at many different types of uh, transposable elements, uh, and uh, they found that for a specific type of transposable element, you have about 0.03 event per million years between uh, three species. So this is for the first uh, type of event, so the transfer of a DNA piece to another species. So if you think about the risk of hybridization, so this risk is high, but it involves a few species, okay? only the ones which are closely related to the gene drive. The risk of transfer is uh, relatively low, but it involves many more uh, potential uh, species, and it's much more harder to, to tackle. And 
So the risk of uh, uh, that the gene is expressed, okay, so the, the Cas9 gene and the G uh, RNA gene are expressed. So here I put you uh, all the different uh, um, gene drive uh, uh, cassettes which have been uh, published uh, so far. So they are all in uh, Drosophila or in uh, mosquitoes and also in uh, mice. And uh, you can see that usually they use a uh, cis regulatory element of a, a germline specific gene for the Cas9 uh, protein. And they use a ubiquitous uh, cis regulatory element for the guide RNA. And even here they use a human uh, cis regulatory element. And in general, I mean, when people try to study uh, cis regulatory element, we can see that the regulatory regions of uh, Drosophila melanogaster or Anopheles, usually they will work in other insects. And uh, mammal uh, cis regulatory, uh, sorry, uh, mouse cis regulatory regions are usually uh, functioning in other mammals. So here, I mean, uh, this cassette is probably uh, functional also. I mean, can drive expression of the gene uh, in mammals. And the ones in uh, Anopheles and Drosophila probably also work in other insects and maybe sometimes in uh, other dipter. So once the CRISPR machinery is expressed, then you need to have a sites in the genome which uh, can be cut. So here I, I uh, did a blast for the target sequence uh, for the gene drive, uh, gene, uh, gene drive cassette which was published in uh, Mus Musculus. So here for this experiment, they decided to target uh, tyrosinase gene so that they can see a phenotype on the color of the mouse. And you can see that uh, here, I mean, I, I did a blast with uh, three different type of uh, PAM sequence. Okay, you have N and GG at the end. And you can see that you target the mus musculus, that's uh, normal, that's expected, but you can also target other mice species. You can also have this site actually in humans. And uh, also you can find it in amphibians, bony fish. I mean, you find it in uh, many, I mean, it's a, okay, it's a 20 uh, nucleotide long uh, sequence. So, so it's not so frequent, but still you can find it in many different genomes. Then you need flanking regions for the gene drive cassette to copy itself. So if you think about hybridization to a closely related species, uh, the sequence will uh, likely to be very similar. So this flanking region will be present as uh, close to the target site. And now if we think of another species, uh, this is uh, more rare. But what will happen is that you will have uh, the gene drive cassette will, which will cut at a specific target site. And if you imagine that uh, this uh, gene drive cassette inserted close to transposable elements, you could have mechanisms which are used by transposable elements, which could be used by the gene drive cassette to insert itself at the site which is cut and which is uh, fragile and uh, which would be repaired. Another possibility is that the gene drive cassette insert in the genome close to regions which are repeats. Okay? So for example, in our genome, we have line elements or transposable elements. And so and, uh, these repeats are present uh, in many uh, uh, places uh, along the genome. And so it's possible that these uh, sequences are also present uh, flanking the target site of the gene drive uh, cassette. And so then it could uh, be used so that the gene drive cassette will insert exactly at the position where it was uh, cutting. So this scenario is uh, possible, but we don't know how likely it is because we don't know yet the size of the flanking region, uh, how far they should be from the cut site, uh, and uh, the percentage of identity that is required for homology directed repair. So all these parameters are important to estimate this probability. So this is something which is uh, possible, but I'm not sure it is highly likely. So more studies are required for, for this. So this is for the flank. Now for the immune system, I mean, I will uh, make it short, but uh, for so the, gui the guide RNA is quite short. It has a short uh, hairpin, which is uh, only uh, 15 uh, base pair, 15 nucleotide. So it will not be recognized by the immune system in insects or in uh, mammals. And then in uh, mammals, I mean, uh, there are new studies which show that uh, there are antibodies against uh, Cas9, which have been found in uh, different populations in humans. So it's possible that uh, some humans are immune to Cas9 expressing cells. But uh, studies are, I mean, uh, are ongoing, and uh, we can see that there are also specific T cells, which are regulatory T cells, which can repress this uh, immune response against Cas9. So it's not so clear. And then the last probability is that the probability that the gene drive, when it, once it's present in one or two individuals, that it will not disappear due to a genetic drift. Okay? And so this probability can be uh, calculated. 
and it's about uh, 0 0.5 to up to uh, 0 0.7, depending on uh, how likely the gene drive uh, can, uh, uh, can affect the, the whole gametes. And uh, so in total, if we look at all the parameters, so if you, if you are really uh, thinking uh, negatively on uh, what would be the worst scenario, then you can imagine that you could have a lot of hybridization events, I mean, uh, with a closely related species. So then, uh, for sure, the gene will be expressed and the cut site will be present. So then this part will be maybe the one which is uh, less likely. So you, but if you think of a non-target species which uh, has a lot, uh, high level of homologous recombination still, this will be uh, quite frequent. And so then you can have a risk of uh, contamination which could be up to 0 0.5 per year, which is uh, very likely. But I mean, this is in the worst case scenario. So in conclusion, gene drives, I mean, are they good or bad? So they are good in the sense that uh, they can eradicate disease and uh, pest species, and they are less expensive than other methods because you can uh, prepare them in uh, the laboratory and then you release them. They are potentially faster than other methods and potentially more powerful, but they are still under development, so this is uh, why they are still bad, okay? They can be potentially less efficient than expected. You can have mutations at the target site so that uh, it makes uh, individuals uh, resistant to the gene drive, so they will not work uh, well. You can also have a cryptic species, so if you have populations which do not hybridize, do not mix with the, tar with the place where you put the new individuals, it will not uh, affect this population, so it could also be a problem. Uh, to me, I mean, uh, one problem I'm concerned about is that it's an uncontrolled system released in the wild. I mean, uh, as I uh, showed you, I mean, it can transfer to other species. And also another risk which is very important and which has not been uh, really quantified so far is the risk on ecosystems. I mean, if you affect one species, how will it affect other species which are connected to it uh, in ecosystems? So if you want to know more about evaluating the probability of CRISPR gene drive, so you can uh, check our paper on uh, BioArchive. So I would like to thank the people who gave us uh, very uh, good comments on uh, the manuscript. And uh, this uh, study wouldn't have been possible also without discussion with a lot of uh, people because it involves, uh, as you can see, many different uh, fields in, uh, in biology. So thank you very much for, for your attention and I'd be happy to answer your question. Thanks.